So good morning again everyone and welcome to our revision session for your CSEC or like not oral sorry paper two exams on Monday coming Monday the 12th. So basically the format is this right we're gonna have two sessions two days. today today we're going to look at the exam look at the format um, and this is all based on the revised um, list of topics on CXC's site for the CSEC Spanish exam. Tomorrow, we're going to look at a little bit. We're going to deal with half of the situations today and the other half tomorrow. Please go on. Um, so tomorrow, please go on. What we're going to do in addition to the situations is we're going to do some um, examples in real time, right? So looking at some past paper questions and stuff. But today, not so much looking at past paper questions or doing past paper questions, but looking at what is required for the different sections of the exams, right? I have some samples from CXC site as well, um, from the subject reports in the past to guide us so that it's not just my word that we're harping on, but we also look in specifically at what CXC requires for specific questions and specific type of questions, how the marks would have been awarded, how marks would have been taken away, that sort of stuff, right? So, vamos a comenzar. Feel free to interrupt me at any time, guys, eh? and ask questions as well. Right? It's an informal session as well. So feel free just to take off your mic and ask a question if need be. So, exam, as we may or may not know, um, the exam is divided into four sections, and all sections are compulsory. This is for your paper to one Monday. You have the section one situation responses, written situation responses. We have letter writing, we have the contextual dialogue, and we have the reading comprehension passage, right? At the end, after going through all four sections, we will summarize. If any questions you all have for further, we could, I will answer them. Any queries, anything, I will answer. If I don't have the answer, I will take your question, your suggestion, your, your query, whatever, and tomorrow, please go, we will address it as well, yeah? So let's begin. So what do you need to know? First and foremost, section one, the situation responses. First and foremost, it is not a translation, right? Many students, when I say many students, I mean in general throughout the Caribbean, sometimes persons make the mistake and translate a situation that is given. For example, they may say your mother is leaving home to run some errands and she leaves some instructions on the fridge for you to do. What, what instructions does she leave? That might be the situation, for example. And persons may make the mistake and translate by giving an, a response or an answer that says, my mother says to do X, Y, and Z. Mi mama dice que tal y tal, whatever, right? That is not what they're asking you to do. You need to put yourself in a position of the person that is given the specific response. It may be you, it may be somebody else as well. So you're always putting yourself in a position of that person and giving a response based on what is being asked for, right? It is important to note as well that some situations do not require a complete sentence. You would see this in the um, instructions as well. In some cases, it's complete sentences. In some cases, this is not. It may be an expression, etc., which may not um, be considered a complete sentence, right? I didn't put it here, but it's very important as well follow all your instructions that are given at the start, right? Um, well, my bad, it is here. Pay attention to the instructions, right? So the, the first thing is actually last and the list here. And also, most importantly, in answering your situation responses is you need to know and understand what language function is needed in this situation, right? This is essential to know because this basically orders the answer that you're going to give, yeah? So based on the, as I said, the list of topics for this year's exam, let us look at some of the language functions. As I say, we'll be doing half of them today. In some instances, CSEC would have divided, would have put it as one, but I divided as two separate things, and we'll see what I'm speaking about a little later, right? So some of the language functions would include advising, accepting, and declining, and apologizing. Let's look at advice and know. So different ways that we can advise someone in Spanish. Te aconsejo que, and aconsejo comes from the verb aconsejar, 
right? Which means to advise. So I advise you that le aconsejo que or les aconsejo que. Just to do a quick stop. Anybody knows the difference between te, le, and les aconsejo? As a matter of fact, instead of asking anyone, let me ask a specific person. Jewel, what is the difference between the te, the le, and the les aconsejo que? All um, means I advise you, but what's the difference? The te is informal, the le is formal, and the le is plural. plural. Excellent. Yeah. Right? So te aconsejo que I advise you, and you're being informal. Somebody that you're well acquainted with, that you know already. Le aconsejo que I advise you, but you're speaking to one person, it could be a stranger, somebody in authority, somebody that where there's an obligation to show respect to, right? And the less I can say, okay, it doesn't matter if it is as formal or informal. Once it's more than one person advising to do something, you see less I can say, okay, right? And by the way, um, the difference, I will be sending these documents to you all after, right? So don't stress over that. So less I can say, okay, as I mentioned, is plural. Also, we can use the phrase, es aconsejable, es aconsejable que, followed by the subjunctive, right? Es aconsejable que, it is advisable that, whatever the uh, action is, right? And in all these instances, you would see that whatever has been advised, is being advised to somebody else. And that is the main reason why it is we use any present subjunctive here. Whatever has been advised is not for yourself, but it is being advised to somebody else, right? We also have debes plus the infinitive that can be used, or debe plus the infinitive. The use state is optional, right? This could be used to give an instruction as well, but it could also be used to uh, give a piece of advice as well. So we have an example in a sentence here. Te aconsejo que estudies por dos horas cada día. I advise you to study for two hours each day. Le aconsejo que estudies, les aconsejo que estudien, sorry, le aconsejo que estudie, o les aconsejo que estudien. So you see how the verb here changes depending on if it's the te, right? If it's the le or if it's the les. I am advising that you, right? I'm advising you that you, whatever, right? Once again, if it is the te, we would use the two version of the verb in the subjunctive. If it's the le, we use the two state version of the verb in the subjunctive. If it's the les, we use the eos, eas, ustedes version of the verb in the subjunctive, right? Let's use the same example using the different sentences here. Debes estudiar, the infinitive, debes estudiar por dos horas cada día. Or debe usted estudiar por dos horas cada día. Nice? Everybody following me so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thumbs sure. up, nice. So we're continuing. Also, accepting and declining, simply using the verb aceptar, A C E P T A R. Right? So, and whatever it is you're accepting, which is the noun, right? That thing. So, to accept is aceptar, yo acepto whatever, to not accept or decline the thing, no accept, okay? So, accepto to invitation de boda, I accept your wedding, boda's wedding, your wedding invitation, or if you want to decline, no accepto, for example, I don't accept your apology, no accepto to disculpa. And as always, I'm deliberately trying to use sentences with vocabulary that could help you to build, right? So, invitation de boda, wedding invitation to disculpa, your apology. Acepto tu invitación, or acepto tu disculpa, I accept your apology. No acepto tu disculpa, I don't accept your apology. Decline it, right? Next, apologizing. We have lo siento, followed by the conjugated verb, I'm sorry, or whatever. Or you could also say siento que, or you could also say lamento que. Right, so let's try it now. Lo siento que no puedo asistir tu fiesta de cumpleaños. I'm sorry that I cannot attend your birthday party. Using the siento, siento que no puedo asistir tu fiesta de cumpleaños. 
I'm sorry that I can't attend your birthday party. Oh, lamento, lamento que no puedo asistir tu fiesta de cumpleaños. Nice? We're moving forward. As I said, today is just to go through the content that is required for the paper to a Monday. And tomorrow we'll do more practice and that sort of stuff, yeah? Next, we're looking at asking permission. How do we ask permission in Spanish? Puedo, followed by the infinitive. Permítame, notice the accent over the I, followed by the infinitive. And some examples here. Puedo ir al baño? Can I go to the bathroom? This is a phrase we may be quite familiar with. Or permítame salir temprano, por favor. Somebody has, you have another meeting to go to today and you would like to request or ask permission to leave our um, class today early. Permítame salir temprano, por favor. Permítame salir temprano, señor. Either one can work, right? Asking permission. Asking questions. We have so many different ways to ask questions in Spanish, so I broke it up into two. One way of asking questions is by using the interrogative words, and we have a list of those interrogative words here. And one thing we need to always remember, all, 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 all the interrogative words you will find having at least one vowel with an accent on it, right? In some instances, if we forget all that accent, we change the word altogether, and you can change the meaning of your sentence as well. So it's extremely important that you remember not only the word, but where the accent goes over which vowel in that word. So anybody could shout out the answer. If more than one person shouts out the answer, I'm fine with that as well. You're going to tell me the meaning of each word, okay? What? Como? How? How? Qual? What? Excellent. So somebody said what? So what is the difference between K and qual? If K means what and qual means what, what is the difference? I just remember that for qual you'd use like qual is the number, like what is your name and like, mm -hmm. but that's what I have now. Okay, great. So this is something that confuses a lot of students and exactly that explanation that you give, usually that's the explanation that persons have in their, in their mind, right? So, K is usually followed by a noun. K fecha es hoy. What date is it? Qual is usually followed by, what did I? Yeah, qual is usually um, followed by a verb. That is one way to think of it. K is usually followed by a noun. Qual is usually followed by a verb. Right? Another way to think of it is that qual actually means which one. So we use qual when the answer that we have is usually a specific one out of a list. Following me so far? Was it Tiana that answered just now? Yes, sir. Right. So think of it like this, Tiana, right? So one of these things is that in um, in our culture as well, but especially in the Latin American culture, you know that persons will usually carry two surnames and two first names. They usually don't, I don't know if they, I never heard anybody call it a middle name, but they usually have four names in total. Their maternal surname and their paternal surname, right? The surname from their mom and their dad, but they also have two names. So usually qual mean, means which one of those two names that you have, not the surname, but the other two names. So Luis Jesus, for example, right? Um, Beatrice Angelica, right? Usually they would have two names. So which is your name? Like which is your first name is almost like they're asking, right? Qual es tu nombre? Qual es tuyo? Qual de los libros es el tuyo? Which of the books is yours? So qual, just to repeat, qual is usually used when it is we want to ask which one. In other words, we choose in one from a possible of an, from um, a list of options, basically, right? What about por qué? Why? Why? And as we notice, there are two separate words, por and que, with the accent on the e. If it is one word without the accent on the e, what does it become? Because. Because. 
Excellent. What about donde? Where. Nice. Cuando. When. Cuanto. How much? How much or how many? What's the difference between how much and how many? This is of English here. What's the difference between how much and how many? Anybody knows? Many is countable, but much is uncountable. Excellent. So many is used for, in Spanish, we don't differentiate, but many is used for countable nouns. Much is used for uncountable nouns. So how many students are in the class? Right? You could count the individual students. But you'll say, how much water do you drink? Right? Water by itself is not countable unless we put it into some measurement. How many liters of water do you drink? Right? Understood? You all with me? Yes, sir. Nice. So here the thing with quantum. Quanto is special from the others because it changes depending on what comes after. So quanto can change to quanta, it can change to quantos, or it can change to quantas. Quanto, how many, when you're referring to one singular masculine thing, right? Quanto is, referring to the price, el precio, quanto is, right? Quantos estudiantes hay? How many students are there? Quantas chicas hay? How many girls are there? Etc. Understood? So remember that with quanto, it changes. Sorry, it changes depending on the noun that comes after. What about adonde? What does adonde mean? Where to? Where to? A donde vas? Where are you going to? Para quien? For who? For who or for whom? Con quien, with who or with whom? And quien is who? Right? So we have an example here of how it will be used. Right? So you miss, let's say we have a situation that says, remember we refocus in the situations we're speaking about. So let's say we have a situation that says something like, you missed school yesterday and you heard that the information for your graduation was given. How do you ask your friend when and where the graduation is? So two pieces of information they're asking for in that situation. They want to know when and where. They want to know if you could ask for those two pieces of information, when and where. So we ask, cuando, or let's say your mom asks you, ¿Cuándo es tu graduación y dónde está? When is your graduation and where is it? Nice? Another way of asking questions, using this language function to answer questions, is by switching the position of the verb, of the subject, and the verb. Usually sentences in Spanish will have the subject followed by the verb, followed by the rest of the sentence, right? So, for example, or to say this in other words, the statement becomes a question. So we may have, tú tienes un bolígrafo. You have a pen. But in order to ask the question, we switch around the subject to and the verb tienes. So it becomes, tienes tú un bolígrafo? Do you have a pen? You all following me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nice. So two ways of asking questions. And as I said, this is an example of one thing they would have given that comment asking question is one language function that is divided into, but I just divided it into the two ways it can be done here, right? We continue in borrowing. How do we borrow something in Spanish? Um, I kind of moving fast too. If you need me to stop or slow down, please, please, as I said, interrupt me and ask me to do so, right? Because I want any questions at the end of it as well. I want you to be able to ask that, right? So borrowing, we, different ways to borrow. Puede usar, puedo usar, followed by whatever the thing is, the noun, the thing that you want to borrow. Or you could say, préstame to, whatever the thing is, lend me your, or préstame su, if we're informal, lend me your, whatever the thing is, let's say it's a pen or whatever. 
Or you can also say, pido prestado to or su, whatever the thing is. So let's use an example here. Pido prestado to dictionary, por favor. Can I borrow your dictionary, please? I forgot to put my um, question marks here, yeah? But pido prestado, that phrase is how we ask to borrow something, right? And we have some other ways that it can be used here. Pido prestado, followed by whatever the thing is you want to borrow, to dictionario, to lapis, et cetera, et cetera. Different ways of congratulating somebody in Spanish, felicidades, felicitaciones, and enhorabuena. This one is not as common, but it's a good one to use. Uh, there's a difference between enhorabuena and felicidades. I've now realized and I did now put it here. Um, enhorabuena could have been used here as well. We usually say enhorabuena, which means congratulations as well for some feat or something that was some success that somebody would have we'll put it like this, some specific thing that somebody would have gained. So for example, enhorabuena por tu victoria, right? Congratulations for your victory or for your por tu premio, for your prize, etc. right? Felicidades and felicitaciones can be used as well, but in the language itself, in Spanish, culturally, we usually find these two being used um, as just the expression itself is, for example, somebody um, reaches a milestone. So, you know, if you want to wish somebody happy birthday, we would say feliz cumpleaños or felicitaciones. It's somebody's anniversary, we say felicidades or felicitaciones. Right? You all following me? Yes, sir. Nice. And enhorabuena most times is used when it's for a specific achievement, a specific thing that somebody would have done that they achieve, they get through doing that thing, as opposed to some milestone, right? So we could have used enhorabuena here as well, right? Enhorabuena por tu victoria, enhorabuena por tu éxito, enhorabuena por tu premio, right? Congratulations for your victory, for your prize, for your success, etc. right? Another language function is consoling somebody. Different ways to console someone, no te preocupes, don't worry. No se preocupe, this is formal. So for example, you got a, um, I'm gonna finish off and I'll give the example then. Todo va a estar bien, everything is going to be fine. O todo estará bien, everything will be fine, right? No te preocupes amigo, tendrás éxito la próxima vez. Don't worry friend, you'll be successful the next time, right? You're consoling somebody, they may have failed an exam or something like that, right? Point I was going to make is no se preocupe is the formal version. So, say for example, um, your teacher may have suffered some sort of disappointment or something, and you want to console your teacher as a result of it. No se preocupe, señor. No se preocupe, profesora, etc. Right? Once again, formal because of who we speak into, who it is we console. All right. Next, we have describing. There are different ways of describing in Spanish. One, the main way is the use of the verb ser followed by the adjective. In some cases, the noun and the adjective, right? You all with me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or the use of the verb ser with the adjective, as we see here. You could also use tener. That's another way of describing, and especially when we're speaking about features of somebody, yeah? But we'll see how it can be used even outside of that, yes. So we have a sentence. La casa es grande y hermosa y tiene los muebles mediterráneos, right? So the house is big and it is beautiful and it has Mediterranean style furniture. Los muebles is how we say furniture in Spanish, yeah? So you may get something that says you have you are on a, you are visiting your friend in Spain and you like their house. How would you describe your, the house to your friend when, um, just now I'm making this up on the spot, let me think better. 
So you are visiting a friend in Spain and you visit their house. How do you describe the house to your mother back home via WhatsApp messaging, right? So the response would be la casa es grande y hermosa y tiene los muebles mediterráneos. Understood? Use of the verb ser, use of the verb tener as well. If we were describing somebody's physical features, for example, um, el señor es alto y muy amable y tiene los ojos o los, las orejas grandes. Tener for these physical features on the face and for the general personality and physical features, alto, amable, we use sir, right? What about when we are explaining? To explain in Spanish, we can once again use the verb ser or tener, and we can also use these expressions that we are seeing here. Me explico, I explain, or I explain myself, or es decir, right? And these two, me explico or es decir, can be used interchangeably, one, and two, they can be used to give further explanation for something. So let's see how it can be used in this example, right? La bebida no es para niños, es decir, contiene alcohol. So the drink is not for children. That is to say, or let me explain, it contains alcohol, right? Es decir, o me explico, can be used interchangeably. Everybody following me so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me just yes, to quick check. Adenike, all as well? Yep. See, sí. something like you're eating. Aleka? Aleka, you with us? Anushka? Good morning, sir. I'm here. Morning, morning. Liam, what's up? All right, clear message in the chat. I don't know what that was naive, but okay. Crucial, right? So we have almost the whole Caribbean here. We have Jamaica, we have Guyana, we have Trinidad and Tobago. We miss some Barbados. Maybe next time. Javon, all as well? Yes, yeah. All right, cool. I know some persons may be having some issues with Wi-Fi and stuff as well, so. I'm seeing you entering and exiting, no stress, right? So, just to repeat, explaining, we may make use of the verb ser or tener, and also these phrases may explico or es decir. So, la bebida no es, use of the verb um, ser here, no es para niños, es decir, contiene alcohol. That is to say it contains alcohol. Could have also used instead of is this me explico. I explain myself further, it contains alcohol. Or you could have simply said, la bebida tiene alcohol. So you all see any contiene and tiene here? What does contiene mean, anybody? It contains. And what is the infinitive? Uh -huh. Hmm? Container. Excellent. Container. So a little vocabulary to appear for us. Whenever we see the verb tener, tener by itself means to have. But when we have words that has a prefix before tener, the tener part usually changes to um, tin, T-A-I-N in English. So container, C-O-N, T-A-I-N, contain. Mantener, M-A-N-T-A-I-N, maintain. Detener, D-E-T-A-I-N, detain, or to stop, right? So just a little vocabulary tip. You may not know all the words, but it's good to know that when you have tener with a prefix, the tener part of the word is the equivalent of T-A-I-N in English, nice? And we usually use back the prefix in the same way in English. So we continue to express disappointment. We would use estoy decepcionado or me decepciona que. 
right? Following everybody. Yes. Sí. Nice. Or even estoy decepcionado porque o me decepciona porque olvidaste mi cumpleaños. Nice. So is the English translation for that? Yeah? Right. Whoa, that's an excellent question. Um, and I just almost passed that straight. But thanks for stopping me there, Nai. Decepcionar, D-E-C-E-P-C-I-O-N-E-R. Looks like what English word? Decepcionar looks like what English word, anybody? Deception. Deception, excellent. Right? It looks like the English word deception, but that is what we call a false friend. It looks like a similar word in um, another language, but it's actually something totally different. So decepcionar actually means to disappoint. Okay? So it disappoints me that I am disappointed that, right? Everybody following? Now you that yeah, answers the question, right? Yes, it does. Nice. Also expressing doubt, do the okay, followed by the subjunctive. You could also use no is seguro okay, followed by the subjunctive. Both can be used to express doubt in Spanish. And we know remember the weirdo, W E I R D O. Doubt will be verbs that express doubt in Spanish, usually followed by the subjunctive, right? So do okay, I doubt that. No, it's a good okay. It is not sure that, followed by the subjunctive. But here the thing, whatever this verb is that follows here is usually for somebody else. So I doubt that he, no, it's a good okay, ella venga hoy. It's not sure that she comes today or that she'll come today. You do okay, I doubt that she will come or that she's coming today. Following me, everybody? Yes, sir. Nice, expressing fear, tener miedo, que or de que, I put it de in brackets because it's um, optional, you could include it, you could exclude it, right? Or temer, T-E-M-E-R, also means to fear, temer que plus the subjunctive. You notice I put subjunctive slash indicative, right? Anybody knows the difference? You want to see the difference? But we would use one, the indicative or the subjunctive. Indicative simply means normal present tense. Those normal tenses that are not the subjunctive and not commands in Spanish, right? Um, well, then, sir, I guess you'll use the subjunctive when you fear something for somebody else. Like, I'm mm -hmm. afraid that you will feel. Or, and then you use the indicative when you are afraid of something. Excellent. So when it's the same subject, we use the indicative, the normal present tense in this case. So, temo que voy a fallar. I am afraid that I am going to fail. Temo que voy a fallar. But, temo que tu mueras. I am afraid that you die. Right? So, fear or expressing fear for something to happen to someone else. We use the subjunctive. Expressing fear for something to happen to yourself. We use the indicative or the normal present tense. For you. Right? Excellent, Jewel. Expressing wishes. We have different phrases, which I know we, we, we know. Quisiera plus the infinitive, right? Me gustaría plus the infinitive, or quiero plus the infinitive. Quiero tener éxito, I want to be successful. Me gustaría tener éxito, I would like to be successful. Quisiera is I would like to as well, right? Quisiera, me gustaría could be used interchangeably. And quiero is simply I want. Once again, these, quisiera, me gustaría, and quiero can also be used with the subjunctive when it is followed by que, and the verb that follows after, wow, that's lexic here, but it's, <laughs> it's for somebody else. So, quisiera que todas, todos mis estudiantes tengan éxito en tus exámenes. I wish or I would like that all my students are successful in the exam. Me gustaría que todas mis estudiantes. Quiero que todas mis estudiantes. I want that day. I would like that day. I would like that day. 
Nice. Understood. Yes, Anybody yes, does sir. not understand, you feel lost, you can say it, you can write it in the chat, you can write it in the chat to me personally, uh, 1v1, if you don't want everybody to see. If you have any questions, queries, you, you feel like if something is still fuzzy, you're not sure what it is, and you want me to explain again, feel free just to message before we move on. Going once, going twice. All right, so we'll continue. Expression wishes. Okay, right. So this is one half of the um this is one half of the language functions. We will do the other half tomorrow, right? Now we move on to letter writing, right? So letter writing. Wait, so before you move on, um, mm -hmm. you think CX will penalize us for not using like the first person and how do I put it? Like you and two when you, starting sentences. Pronouns? Yeah, subject pronoun. No, they won't penalize the Fed once you're using it. Once you're using the verbs correctly, it should be good. Oh, I think. So, say for instance, you want to say TNA usted un bolígrafo. It asks it's a request or asks for a pen or something. You could leave out the usted if you like. You are missing a pen and you see your teacher has more than one pen in his pocket. How do you ask for a pen from a teacher? Señor, ¿tiene usted un bolígrafo o simple tiene un bolígrafo? You will lose marks for, for leaving all the usted there. Right? Yes, sir. Nice. So letter writing. First and foremost, read the and follow all instructions before you start. Right? All instructions. Right? The, uh, the exam is 2 hours and 15 minutes. How I like to break it down, four sections. I like to say person should take maximum 30 minutes per section and the 15 minutes that they have use that to read through the different sections of the exam i would suggest that you take approximately three minutes to speed read the exam at the start right see some of the situations speed read the situations to see what come in mostly read the letter and the um contextual dialogue to see what it's asking for, right? But in the actual execution of doing of each part, situations, letter, contextual dialogue, and the reading comprehension, you should aim for a maximum of 30 minutes to attempt the whole section, each section, right? So for each situation, that is almost like three minutes per situation, for the actual letter writing, I would say you take about five minutes to plan, 20 minutes to actually write, and about five minutes to read over your letter before you move on to the contextual dialogue. Read um, and understand, and you'll see what I mean by read when we reach the contextual dialogue, etc. right? So a good way to gauge yourself is 30 minutes for each section. So letter writing, Read and follow the instructions. Remember your format. And by following the format, you're not only giving yourself the advantage of getting the marks that are required, but also reaching the word count, right? We would see, and you would see why I say this as well in the ex specific example that we have of the letter. I believe, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, right? But you will see exactly why I say this. Remember that for CSEC, C -SEC, Spanish, you would almost always be required to write an informal letter, right? There are specific guidelines for writing a formal letter, which some of the vocabulary and stuff and format is a bit different. So for CSEC purposes, I've never seen an instance. The only reason why I put almost is because I never speak in absolutes. But for this level, they require an informal letter. You write into somebody you know. Even if it's an aunt, it's somebody you know well, an aunt, an uncle, a family member, a friend, etc. 
right? It wouldn't be that stranger, it wouldn't be that boss, that sort of stuff, right? Also, some of the popular topics, CSEC specifically said that you'll be writing, CXE, sorry, specifically said that you'll be writing a letter about an event or something that you attended, right? However, I included a list of popular topics. Natural disasters is not so much something I attended, but it is a popular topic, right? So some of the other popular topics include birthday parties, a birthday party I may have attended, what was the planning, the events that took place, the details, if it was a surprise, how the surprise came about, that sort of stuff. These are some of the popular things they may ask for. Natural disasters, and a natural disaster might may not necessarily be, you wouldn't attend a natural disaster, but you may not have been able to attend a specific function or event because of a natural disaster. So you would need to know the vocabulary specific to that as well. Vocabulary specific to flood, hurricane, earthquakes, volcano. We saw a volcano in St. Vincent recently. That sort of stuff, right? Graduations, that's another thing that you may attend that topics have come on this before. Weddings, sports days, this one has been seen before. Travel, especially if you attended some exchange um, trip or a field trip to somewhere. It, this may be to another country. It may be to somewhere within your country, etc. right? So in general, they bring in a topic based on something that you may have attended. And tomorrow as well, we will get specific vocabulary to these themes that we see in here, nice? We good so far, everyone? Yes, sir. Good morning, yes, sir. Abdul Kudos. Yes, sir. All right, let's continue. So we're looking at the letter writing format slash sample. And before you even go into it, anybody wants to remind me of the format? You may have done this in school. You may have done this with me before. You, you know, the, what is the format for the letter? You may have done this in the lessons before. What, what 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 format do we look at? The address being on the top right, the top right, right hand, right. and then for the left hand, I think you like skip a line after mm -hmm. the address on the left side. Then you'd put like Carido, um, you know, dear whomever. Then the so first was paragraph. One second. Was one second. Oh. Top right hand corner the um, address and the date. The address, they usually don't ask you to write out a whole address like number four, um, Southern Main Road, um, Shagornas, no. Usually just the country or the city. So Portmore, um, Once de Julio, de 2021, or um, let's see. Linden, on city, whatever, or um, Arima, Dego Martin, etc. Just the city and the date is required. Below that, the greeting, querido, querida, etc. What comes after that, Fiana? So we skip a line after the date and the address. Then on the left hand side now, we switch sides, we put the greeting. After the greeting, what comes next? Then we would have like the first paragraph in which we would like extend greetings to like our friend or whomever we're writing to and like like i hope you're doing well something like that then that's the paragraph when you'd um put the purpose of the letter while you're writing. i want to pause again for that right after you're greeting thanks so far um tiana coming back to you right after the greeting it is suggested that you put your, an introductory paragraph of approximately 25 words, right? Approximately, maximum 25 words. And in that introductory paragraph, as Tiana said, you will include, you will inquire about the person's well being and about their health. Hola, como estas? Como esta la familia? Hace un rato que no hablamos. It's been a while since we spoke. Um, Ojalá que todo esté bien. I hope to God that everything is fine. And you also state your purpose of writing. I would also provide you a little format of the, this, which I have. You state the purpose of for writing a letter. 
estoy escribiendo para decirte, te uh, escribo para decirte, etc. Right? I could simply say, say it more um, implicitly. Let's say uh, you're writing about a birthday party. Asistí a la mejor fiesta de cumpleaños en mi vida. I attended the best birthday party in my life. That introduces what you're going to talk about. You know you're going to speak about a birthday party, and you know it's going to be all the good things about it. Or, pasé un desastre tremenda. Right? I experienced a, a tremendous or horrible disaster. If you're going to speak about some natural disaster or something, etc. Right? So just to recap, 20. Introductory paragraph after the greeting, which would include inquiring about the person's health, and well-being or that of their family as well state any purpose for your letter and most importantly maximum 25 words what's next diana um sometimes i would include the first cue in the first paragraph as well excellent sometimes that happens yeah then for the second paragraph i would include the second and the third cue Mm -hmm. Then for the fourth paragraph, I would include the last cue, and sometimes I would also put the close, um, put the the closing remarks that I hope you write me soon, instead of having like four, like yeah, four instead of having four paragraphs, and Ex then after Go ahead, the sorry. closing, then the closing. Excellent. So just to recap, top right hand corner date slash where you're writing from address. Skip a line, left, hand, left corner, greeting, querido, querida. Um, next, we have the introductory paragraph. You could skip a line there too. If you're not skipping a line, make sure to indent, right? You skip a line or you indent and you have an introductory paragraph which inquires about the person well being and that of the family state the purpose for writing and in some instances you may be able to include the first bullet point in what they say you need to include or write about any letter you can have a body of the letter which could be two paragraphs paragraphs two and three and usually um it's usually five different points it would give you on things to write on so usually let us use this and see if we could look at it i don't like the idea that i just speak in um so look, in this case, we have four points, right? So you will have to take care of your younger sibling while your parents went out, write a letter to a friend in Chile relating your experience. So the, the, the topic is? Uh, um, I think you're not seeing, you're not seeing the screen, sorry. Yeah, I'm right, so let's look at it here, right? using the same thing that Tiana said, and I would fill in as well, before we even go, before we even go to the actual example that we saw from CSEC and the candidate. Let's see if we can work through that here now. So top right-hand corner, matter of fact, I'll type it up now for you. I think I could type fast enough. It may be better for you to see now. Right, so top right hand corner, we have the city you're writing from, followed by the date, right? That's for, yeah, the greeting and date. Next we have... Sir, won't you put the specific day? Pardon? Won't you put the specific day after Diego Martin? It's not necessary. Okay. You mean the specific day of the week? Yes, sir. Um, I mean, like the twenty third of July, or oh, that no, that's my bad. I I typed it, but the number lock was off. Sorry, once day. That is my mistake. Sorry. 
11 de julio de 2021. Querido, querida, Juan, um, what's our girl name in Spanish? Laura. Right? So, yeah. How much words we have? How many words we have? Yeah. 138 or 150 words. And where did it start coming down from? This is a debatable topic. Um, I would say they start accounted from here. I've not seen in any of the subject reports I've read a specific thing that tells us, but usually, and we would see, yes, no. We will double check it here as well. Content, word count. We could double, double check it in this example, right? But um, I would usually count from the greeting, querido, querida, until the um, con cariño or besos y abrazos, etc., Paula, etc., here, right? But I've been looking for that specific information. I haven't seen it in the syllabus. I have not seen it in the, um, what you call the subject reports as well. Right, so the introduction will usually inquire about well-being of person we would also state reason for writing letter right maximum 25 words then we have the body the body could be comprised of one to two paragraphs I usually advise two paragraphs. Matter of fact, to help you, let me make it easier by saying two paragraphs, right? So I would say two paragraphs and 50 words per paragraph. Maximum, right? Anybody, we say we take two points. So the bullet points one and two in body paragraph one. And then take points two and three in body paragraph two, which would be the third one of the overall, right? You all following me so far? Yes, sir. Anybody lost, please say or message me privately to say. Okay, I don't see some messages came through before. Okay, I saw somebody ask if you were to write the full address, how would you write it? For the purposes of CSEC, exactly how I wrote it here is the way. And listen, as I said once again, this is not Senior Week's opinion. I've specifically seen in the subject report where CX spoke about this, if I'm not mistaken, it was 2014, where CSEC spoke about this, stating that this is the appropriate way to write it, to write the, um, the, the date, the, the place you're writing from and the date written like this, on say day, month, so the day of the month of the year, right? So two paragraphs, you have the intro, you have the body. Excuse yes, sir. Yeah. So so just the city and the date is fine? Yep. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong, eh? I know it's possible, and I ain't trying to cause no bacchanal. <laughs> um, Jamaicans and Guyanese, you all know what bacchanal is, right? No confusion, no passa. I don't know why it's called it in Guyana, right? As I said, I know it's possible that persons may have teachers that told them differently, but I am saying to you all that these instructions and this advice that I'm given is based on the CSEC, CXE Spanish, or the CXE, CSEC Spanish subject report, if I'm not mistaken, the year was 2014. 
either 2012 or 2014. These are not my personal um, opinions that I'm trying to use to strike my ego to prove I know it. Nope. This is based on CXE stipulation, right? Regarding the day that is. Regarding the ordering so that you, and the format so that you make the word count, as I said, introduction, 25 words, your body, like that be two paragraphs. The first paragraph is you, you, you write on the two points. The second body paragraph, you write on the other two points. Points three and four. Right? So we have 25, 50, 50, that is 125. And then finally, yeah, conclusion. In this paragraph, this is where you would end it off usually. And once again, 25 words max. You all with me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the end of your letter by asking the person to reply soon. Um, give regards to family or give feedback on what you said, etc. Right? So that's some of the things that you could put in this ending of paragraph. Right? And of course, finally, you have your un abrazo. And another thing, never use your real name, right? So use a makeup name. Let's use Jamal for this instance here, right? Un abrazo, Jamal. And this is your ending, right? Everybody with me? Yes, sir. So this is your... letter format all right once again i will send this to you all as well um theana was saying that's how you should issue in if it's five points you could find yourself where it is you can put the point bullet point number one in the introduction i've seen that happen before and that, that is normal um also split up the points between paragraphs like this so that you could meet the word count as well, as I say, up to 50 words per each one, so that you order it in such a way, put it in such a format, so that it helps you to reach your word count, yeah? And that's why I find that is interesting is for this reason. Let's look at this paragraph here, at this letter, sorry. Using the following as a guide, write in Spanish a letter of no more than 130 to 150 words. Use the tense or appropriate tenses to the topic you, which you have chosen, well, not chosen, but given, right? And this is the topic, or this is the situation, the, the letter. You were left to take care of your younger siblings while your parents went out for the day. Write a letter to your friend in Chile relating your experience. So automatically, what tense are we going to write in here, guys? Past tense. Past tense, specifically? Pretense. You're speaking about on one specific day and you're speaking about something that occurred and ended. Right? Is not you're not recounting your experience of when you used to take care of your siblings whenever your parents had to work the night shift. It was not an ongoing thing, but it was one specific thing, one specific instance of having to take care of your siblings, your younger siblings, right? And some of the, one of the ways to know which tense, if we could look for little cues within the instructions that are given. So you were left, this is the, what we call it again? Past perfect, right? So we know something in the past that recently ended. Went, use of the past tense again, 
right? And you're relating this experience of all that happened when you went out and you were left to take care of your siblings, right? If it is, you say, for example, you are planning to visit your friend in Chile for their graduation, to attend their graduation, right? And they tell you to write a letter to your friend telling them about all the things that you plan to do and all the things that you look forward to doing. What tense will that be? Future tense. Yeah. Future tense is something that is yet to happen. It hasn't happened yet. So we need to take, pay very careful attention to what is being said here, which would guide us as to what tense we're going to use, right? So we take care of the siblings. You need to include, include when and why you were left in charge. So this gives us a situation of where the parents went that would put you in a place to be in charge. The responsibilities you undertook for the day. So that will be listing some of the things that you had to do. It could be chores, etc. How your siblings behaved, right? How your parents will reward you for your work. So let's look at it now. This is an actual response of somebody from within the Caribbean region, right? So Belly say anybody wants to read? No? Nobody wants to read? Okay, let me read that. And we would see that there are some mistakes in here, right? And we look at the, the um the recommendations, etc. given my CSEC at the end. So Carry that map. Well, Belize, you see they put the um, country in this case, right? Belize. Belize, they see Nueve de Mayo, Dale, Dos Mil Once. They or Dale is fine here as well, right? Don't stress over that. Querida Marta, tuve que cuidar a mis hermanos pequeños hoy. Mis padres salieron a celebrar su aniversario y la niñera no pudo venir. Por eso me dejaron a mí encargada de cuidar. Los. The fact that they use encargada here, we know that the person that is writing is a girl, right? Tuve que comprar comida con la vecina y también lave los platos. Fuimos al parque a divertirnos y al regresar vimos la televisión. También ordenamos pizza y comimos. La pizza estaba muy sabrosa. También tuve que barrer Pero mis hermanos me ayudaron. Mis hermanos se portaron muy bien. Me ayudaron mucho. No se portaron mal. Me ayudaron. Just no. Sorry, no se portaron mal. Me dijeron que soy la mejor hermana y también la mejor niñera. Mis hermanos me dijeron que quisieran que mis padres salieran más seguida y que me dejaron encarga, encargada de ellos a mí. Mis padres me darán una recompensa, me llevarán a comprar ropa mañana por la tarde. Yo podré escoger vestidos, blusas, pantalones, Y muchas cosas más. Cuídate, amigo. Besos y abrazos para tu familia. Que pases un buen día ahí en Chile. Con cariño, Paula. Anybody seen any mistakes so far that they want to point out before we actually go into it? What is the first glaring mistake? Based on all that we spoke about so far with the letter, what is the first glaring mistake that we see? There's no intro. There's no intro. There's no format. It's one big long paragraph. Well, two paragraphs, one huge long paragraph and a second one. And I want to point out something specifically with this. Imagine CXC would have used this to say this is a sample excellent letter. I repeat, imagine CXC would have used this to say this is a sample excellent letter. So to me, the most basic thing that doesn't involve you having any intense knowledge of the language, if it is you were to include that, you would get additional marks off the bat. 
and this is not my post personal opinion once again the letter required specific characteristics with regard to format look they are saying it here right in addition to addressing the cues so they they're going to tell us about the specific areas of the letter that were good and that were bad right so it required a specific format the candidates adhere to that format by including the place the date a salutation opening and ending it was relevant well developed and coherent all cues were addressed and the ideas were expressed linguistically right just they wrote it am i mistaken it somewhere measures for improvement the quality of the response could have been enhanced by Spelling, use of accents. The letter could have been more adequately structured with the use of paragraphing. I know it was somewhere here. Sorry, it was quite at the end. So this is one of the things for improvement. And even in the face of lacking this, they would have still be considered as an excellent thing, as an excellent letter. Now, this is not an excuse for you to throw format, format or the window. But the point that I'm making is that, as clearly explained by CSEC, the, require, the letter required specific characteristics with regard to format. So that is one of the things that they are looking at, and you would be judged based on content. It is one of the, the criteria. So by simply following that simple format that can be easily learned off, you put yourself in a position to get marks off the bat. Understood? Any other mistake? Anybody saw? Anybody else saw? So we've seen a lot of ticks. All those ticks means correct expressions and stuff, right? But there are also some things inside here. Two V does not have an accent on the E. So this is one mistake that the person made. His padre salieron. So you notice the correct tense is used. Two V salieron, pudo etc which is all the preterite tense right so accent is not supposed to be here for eso is written as one word when it should be separated as two words for eso meaning for that reason excuse me or for that but because of that they left me in charge of taking care of them me should have an accent on the i we call this a disjunctive pronoun usually those pronouns that comes after the uh, what you call this part of speech again? Uh, um, para, etc. Preposition. <laughs> right. Those pronouns that come after the preposition, para me, a uh, el, para ti, etc., you usually carry an accent. Right. So am I with the accent as opposed to my, right? M E, sorry, am I me by itself without the accent means my, me libro, my book, etc. But am I with the accent? Me means me. And it's what we call a disjunctive pronoun, right? So for that reason, they left me in charge of taking care of them. Once again, Tuve, you see they put a mark there again. I had to buy food with the neighbor. So a wrong accent there again. Tambien, an X is put there because what, what is missing from Tambien? Accent. Mm -hmm. Accent over the E. And lave, missing an accent over the E as well. Tuve, que compra comida. I had to buy food with the neighbor. And also, I had to wash the dishes, or I washed the dishes, rather. Right? We went to the park to have fun, and upon returning, we looked at television. Also, we ordered pizza, and we ate. Pizza was very delicious. Also, I had to sweep, but my siblings, they helped me. Me ayudaro, right? My siblings behaved well. Portarse, bien, is to behave well, right? They helped me a lot. They didn't behave bad. This is kind of repetitive. I guess they maybe do that to help with the word count, right? They said to me, me dijeron, they said to me that I am the best sister and also the best. What is la niñera again? Anybody knows what la niñera means? La niñera is the babysitter, 
right? So she made mention of it here before, the babysitter was not able to come. So they told me I'm the best sister and babysitter. My siblings said to me that they would like that my parents, or they would have liked that my parents left more often, accent missing over the A, or would have left more, and that they left me in charge of them, right? So this is the use of the past subjunctive here. Medi heron K. They said to me, past tense, they wished. So you know where the present subjunctive is usually the present tense. Your recommendo K is to this present subject present tense followed by the present subjunctive. Past tense, specifically the um, preterite, expressing a desire or a wish here, past subjunctive, right? Right, my parents said, or they gave me, me dieron. So this is wrong, not daran, but dieron. Um, my parents gave me a recompense, as a recompense or a reward, right? They, that should be will carry me, right? They will carry me to buy um, clothes tomorrow afternoon. I would be able to, once again, something wrong here, podre, podre. Hmm, none of this is a mistake to me. Podre does not have an accent on the E. Right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So this, I would be able to choose dresses, blouses, and pants, and many stuff more, many other things, right? Take care, friend. Hugs and kisses for your family. I hope you have a good day there in Chile with love from Paola. Right? So, as I said, based on CSEC, this is an example of an excellent answer. And I always use this deliberately. I always use this deliberately. The reason why is that many students have a lot of anxiety going into the exam. And many students express that the letter is one of those things that give them trouble. Right? And they think that everything needs to be perfect for the answer to be excellent. But as we see here, this person was missing accents, right? They put accents where accents was not supposed to be. In few instances, they had a bit of incorrect expression. They miss out letters. There were mistakes throughout this passage. They forget the format or they had incorrect format. All these are errors that we see. So this is why I always stress This is why I always stress. One second, guys. Sorry about that. This is why I always stress that you work with what you have, work with the material, work with what they're asking us for, right? Work on being fluent, meaning letting your thing flow. CXC is not expecting a native speaker, right? So we know to look out for the tense, we know to look out for the format, we know to pay attention to the specific things we have to write about. And once we do that, to the best of our ability, mistakes will come because you are not perfect. Right? Don't worry about the mistakes too much, but focus on writing and sticking to what they're asking for. Right? And as we see here, even with mistakes, this person's response was still considered an excellent um, answer. And let us just look again at some of these specific characteristics. They consider fluency, coherence, clarity, and appropriateness to the situation, grammatical accuracy, the range of vocabulary and idioms used, and length. Right? This lesson in particular required that the person provide information, outline activities in the past tense, which we established before, report on one or more activities, and give details in the future as well. I think the last bullet point is into the future, which we need to pay attention to. All your parents will reward you for your good work. So this is a hint that this addressing this specific point is the future tense, makes use of the future tense, right?
So, um, as we saw here, the content, specific things are required, format, um, paying attention to the cues, having it relevant and appropriate, et cetera, to the cues. Quality of the language, this was good, especially you see that use of the past subjunctive. That will always boost up your marks and show what we call mastery of the language. And that is why, specifically, when we go into examples tomorrow, we will see different examples that we could use to show mastery of the language. Phrases that we could learn off to put in the introduction and in the conclusion that would automatically show and have us use any language at a high level, right? So you could keep it, if it is, is something that you're struggling with, you keep it simple in the bullet points, but you know you have these phrases that you could use off and that will show mastery of the language, would boost up your mark automatically from the start, right? Um, good demonstration of correctness of expression here, excellent use of idiom and vocabulary use, the range. They manage some complex structures correctly and display the level of competence not usually apparent with most persons at this level. Specifically, they're talking about the use of the imperfect or past subjunctive here. Whenever here I must say imperfect or past, it's the same thing I'm referring to. It's just two words that it goes by, but it's the same tense, right? Good command of the elements of grammar, as we see here, subjunctive mood, both present and imperfect, formation and use, preterite tense, future tense, object pronouns, may the hair on, may recompense, not me recompense, uh, sorry. Um, Sepo, no, that is reflexive. There were a couple instances of the use of the object pronoun. Me ayudaron, me dijeron, et cetera, right? So the use of these things too would have boost, boosted the mark. Um, use of the infinitive, the imperative, the personal act. Once again, the personal, I want the object of our sentence, the person. Okay, no problem, I got your message. Tiana. GPS again, right? So the personal, I want the object of our sentence is a person. We need to put this preposition, a immediately after the verb. Yo amo a mi madre, I love my mother but we put the amo a because it's a person, your mother, right? Length, the candidate comply to the rubric and conform to the acceptable length. And this is a piece of insider info you're getting here. Although they say 130 to 150 words, the acceptable length is 10 words less, 120 words, up to 20 words more, to 170 words, right? Nice? And we saw the measures for improvement, correct spelling, use of the accents, recompensa instead of pesa, de heron, no I after the J, right? Omission of the accents in Tambien, et cetera, and the format. Nice. Everybody's good. Just check in again with you all. What am I doing? Yes, sir. One question I was going to ask before I got kicked off. After sure. you write the querido or the querida and the person's name, is it a comma or a colon? Um, I've seen both used, to be honest. I have seen both used. But I would say if you use any comma in the following line, you indent from the paragraph. If you use any colon, skip the line and start from the margin and skip the line between okay. the paragraph. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on the letter before we continue? Nay? Something I was going to ask. Um, if you have to indent the first line of every paragraph. Indent the first line what? Can you repeat that? Of every paragraph. As I, well, the question was answered. Um, if after the greeting you use the comma, I would suggest that you go to the next line and you indent. If you're using the colon after the greeting, you skip the line and then you write from the um, margin, the left margin, and between each paragraph, you skip your lines. That is what I advise that you do. That's it. 
The reason why I, I, I can't say with certainty is because I haven't seen it outlined in the CSEC subject reports, which is where we'll usually get our information, but I've seen different textbooks say different things. But of course, we know the authority is CSEC. So, any other questions on letter writing before we continue? So, we could use a block format for this. What format? Block. I mean by block format. Like where everything on one side, the left side. You know, and then paragraphs, you know, you just skip lines between it. I think that was what I was talking about. Yeah, that's what I was expressing. So if it is you're not skipping a line, indent, right? Let the paragraph start a little bit away from the margin. If you are skipping lines between paragraphs, start at the margin. Understood? Megan, all is well? I know some persons will be in and out listening and organizing themselves as well. Kershaw. Yes, sir. How's the weather in Guyana? Kind of cloudy today, but. Okay, okay. I know some persons were affected by um, this hurricane here at the Barbados. But you all are more southerly than us, so I doubt you all were affected. All right, guys, so we're moving on, right? We're going to the contextual dialogue now. If you have to get a drink of water in between and stuff, no problem. Just leave this stuff floating out, right? Right, so now we go to the contextual dialogue. Once again, read and follow all instructions. Remember your format, right? Follow the format by doing this. You are you put yourself in a position to not only get your marks, but also meet the word count as well. This should not RW here, but ensure that your dialogue is conversational and that it flows, right? Remember, this is different from a letter. So always keep in mind that there's a back and forth between you and the person, right? Even though it's individual lines are written, it should read, it should sound like an actual conversation where one thing that is said leads on to the other person responding, leads on to the other response and like that, right? Make use of idioms and other informal language here. Once again, let's look at the a sample contextual dialogue. <laughs> What I like to say with format before we continue, we go into the details of it. I advise students in order to meet the word count and to stick to the format, two things I advise students to do. One, of course, respond to all the cues, pay attention to the specific cues that they, they tell you to use, right? We have five in this instance. And in order to stick to the cues and the word count, excuse me, two things help us. One, in responding to each blank space, always, you all are not seeing your screen, I apologize. So, not today, Nai, not today. Hey. I'm teaching you, you ask me a question in the middle of teaching. Right? So, as I was saying, <laughs> Before I was rudely interrupted, excuse, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry about that, right? As I was saying, one of the things that helps is by paying attention to answer the blank spaces, is by paying attention to what is said before and what comes after. What is said before the blank space cues what you start off saying here. What is said after is skewed by what was ended off saying in the blank space. So the blank space should always contain two pieces of information. I'm not saying two sentences, but two pieces of information. Pieces of information that each blank space should contain are a prompt, which is a or a response to what was said before 
and a prompt to what is said after. I repeat, each blank space should usually contain two pieces of information. One, a response to what was said previous to the blank space and a prompt to what will be said after, All right? So let's look at the example from it up. So we have a contextual dialogue, 80 to 100 words. We need to use to insert specifically information to be provi provided, right? So we need to complete the dialogue between you and Pablo by giving responses. And this is the context that we have for the dialogue. We have been in trouble quite a lot recently. In okay, let me just stop. I have a raised hand, go ahead. Maybe um, 70 to 120 in this case applies here. You'll see. <laughs> I'll write to bottom. 70 to 110, right? <laughs> For marking purposes. That don't mean that you're gonna try and write less or more, right? Oh, please, but thanks. No problem. So you have been in trouble quite a lot recently in school and realize that you must change your approach to your studies to ensure a bright future. Your best friend Pablo share some ideas with you on how you should improve. All right, responses to the cues below. Responses to all of the cues listed below must be included. Greetings and expressions of your feelings. Explanation for your feelings at the moment. Description of the nature of your problem. Details of your plan, of the plan for your improvement. And expressions of appreciation to your friend. 20 marks. So, greetings and expressions of feelings. I want to look at how it is we, print, we adhere to the cues given and also the same thing I was giving you all about what comes before and after, right? This that we see here is the same thing that was explained above, right? So, we need to greet and express feelings and <clears throat> As we start off by doing that, usually it will be in the first or the, the first two or maybe the first um, blank spaces. So we see that he says here, hola, que tal? So this cues us to know that whatever comes after will be a greeting and a response to que tal, a response to how we are going. And what comes after is por que and que te pasa. So what comes before in the blank space should cue your friend to ask you why and what happened. And they said they want a greeting and expression. So look how the two coincide or collide. Hola, Pablo. Estoy un poco triste y a la vez enojada. Once again, enojada indicates us that it's a girl that is writing. So, hi, Pablo. I am a bit sad and a la vez at the same time angry. So that fulfills all. It greets with Ola. It expresses the feelings. Excuse one second. Sorry about that. It expresses the feelings, which would prompt the person to ask why we are feeling so and what happened. Right? So, Ola Pablo, I'm a bit sad and at the same time angry. Pablo asks, why? What happened? Explanation of feelings at the moment. So we're responding to this. And what comes after? Continuan tus problemas con el profesor de matemáticas. ¿Verdad? Cuéntame. Your problems with the maths teacher continues. Isn't that true? Tell me. So something would have, it would have been a response to what happened here. What would have you would the person to say or to ask if it is problems with the maths teacher still exists. And Quintame shows that you do not tell what happened with the maths teacher here, but it comes after, right? So I didn't include this before, I forgot to include it, but we need to also remember to read through all the cues and all the responses by the other persons before we start to write, because it's very possible that uh, you could have never read through all of these and you start to answer one time. So you say, well, all right, well, weeks man say to look at what comes before and after. And you see the person talk about 
um, your problem with the maths teacher continue. So you say, aha, I would have said something here for them to say that our have problems with the maths teacher and for them to say that in continuing. And in error, what is really being said is that the person says, it's not true, they ask, they're already asking a question based on a statement, and then they ask you to tell them about this specific statement after. So in other words, saying the problem with the maths teacher should come here and not here. So let us see what is being said here. Por qué? ¿Qué te pasa? Bueno, es porque recientemente me he estado portando muy mal en el colegio y también con los profesores. Well, it's because recently I have been behaving. No accent should be here. I don't know if there's an accent or a tick, right? Maybe it's a tick. I have been behaving quite bad in school and also with the teachers. So that cues them to ask now or to make a statement followed by a question. The problems with the math teacher continue, isn't that so? Tell me. So you're going to tell them about the problems with the math teacher or the math class. And then, por qué te envío a la oficina del director ayer? So probably, as well, something is mentioned that you were sent there. Right? You were sent to the principal's office. Possibly, let's see. Sí, porque estoy fallando mi clase de matemáticas. No puedo pasarme. Cuesta estudiar, Pablo. So, yes, responding to the problems in the math class. Yes, because I am failing my math class. I cannot pass. It's costing me a lot to study, or it's a lot of effort to study, Pablo, right? So, we see here where it was not a case of that. He has this information, Pablo, and he's now asking about it. Why did they send you to the principal's office yesterday? Right? And then he says, ¿Y qué te dijo ayer cuando fuiste? What did he say to you when you went to his office? Right? So, because I did not want to do a specific homework task the day prior. No accent, right? So, why did they send you to the principal's office? Because I didn't want to do a homework exercise the day before. And then Pablo asks, and what did the principal say to you? The principal said to me that me dijo que fuera para la casa para pensar en lo que había hecho. Principal said to me too that I should have gone to my house or gone home to think about what I had done. This does not leave much space. That's what we're talking about. What the principal said to you, what comes after, como puedo ayudarte? Anybody who wants to think of what could have been included here, consistent with what I said to you, where you look at what comes before and after. Anything could have come before here to end, to cue the person asking, ¿Cómo puedo, Pablo asking, ¿Cómo puedo ayudarte? How can I help you? Anybody? He probably asked Pablo to help. And how will we have said that in Spanish? Anybody? Necesito, Necesito tu ayuda. Ayúdame, por favor. Anything like that, right? So, then he says, ¿Cómo puedo ayudarte? How can I help you? How can I help you? Pues, no estoy muy segura, Pablo. I'm not quite sure, Pablo. Pero tal vez, but perhaps, me pudieras dar unas clases de matemáticas en tu tiempo libre. But perhaps... You can give me some maths class or maths classes rather in your free time, right? But I've even said here, yeah, ¿Qué piensas? ¿Qué opinas? ¿Qué te parece? What do you think? Asking for the opinion. ¿O puedes hacerlo? Can you do it? So then cue the next response. Eso es facilísimo. That's easy. Tú sabes que me encantan las matemáticas. You know that I love maths. Si quieres, if you want, puedo ir a tu casa los sábados. I can come to your house on Saturdays para darte explicaciones, to give you explanations y ayudarte a revisar los ejercicios de matemáticas and help you to revise maths exercises. Right? So respond, si, true, or I could have even said instead of si, could have said en serio, en, and then S-E-R-I-O, seriously or truly. 
Muchas gracias, Pablo. Eres un gran amigo. Thanks a lot, Pablo. You're a great friend for helping me. Right? To which Pablo responds, llámame para saber si tu, tus padres están de acuerdo. So call me to know or to let me know if your parents are in agreement. Sí, te voy a, te voy a llamar cuando llegue a casa. There should be subjunctive here, right? I'll explain why in a second. Hablamos más tarde. Más tarde, adiós, Pablo. Right? Forgive me, right? I'm forgetting you. You, the oh gosh. certain propositions, sorry, certain propositions are followed by the subjunctive. So, cuando, tal vez, quizás, etc. They you usually followed by the subjunctive when the action that comes after or the verb that comes after has not happened as yet. I repeat. Certain prepositions, certain words such as cuando, tal vez, quizás, right? Uh, mientras, they are followed by the verb in the subjunctive when it is the action that it is referring to has not happened yet. So in other words, it is possible to happen. So see, yes, I'm going to call you when I arrive at home. Hablemos más tarde. Adiós, Pablo. This should be hablemos. So in both, cuando llegue, when I arrive, and we will speak later, this should be the subjunctive being used. Understood? Because the action has not happened as yet. Right? I would call you when I arrive at home. Right? We will speak when I arrive at home. You all understand so far? Yes, sir. Is it also because that it's not guaranteed will happen? Say that again. I'm asking, is it also because it's not guaranteed that that act will happen? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Why, if I was breaking up a bit there, but just to repeat your question, is it also because it's not a guarantee that the action will happen? And the answer to that is yes. Um, the subjunctive is very common in Spanish. It's not as common in English. It is. It does exist in English, but it's very commonly used in Spanish. You know, like how we would usually say tomorrow, God willing? Yes. Or tomorrow, please, God. We would say that in English. You all have heard that phrase, that statement, yeah? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay, Anushka. Anushka, why do we say tomorrow, God willing, or tomorrow, please, God? Why? Because why do you think we say that? that it will happen. Pardon? Because it's not certain that it will happen. Exactly. It isn't certain. So, that let's think of it like this, right? Within our English way of thinking and our English consciousness, it's almost like tomorrow is not pro promised. I don't know if I will wake up when I go to sleep tonight. I don't know if I'll wake up tomorrow, right? We're not trying to be morbid or fatalistic or anything, but I don't know what tomorrow holds. It is in God's hands. So that's why we will say tomorrow God's willing, right? We're trusting and hoping in God. Um, or what Muslims would say, inshallah, correct? I know that we have a... Um, a Muslim in the class as well, a Muslim would say inshallah, which is the same phrase, right? It's almost like if it pleases God, right? It's the same concept, and the concept is more popular in Spanish. An action, and we're not sure for the action to happen, and usually it is expressed as we're not sure when there's a preposition first, followed by a future action, right? So, cuando, mientras, hasta que, tal vez que, right? All these phrases or prepositional phrases followed by an action that is going to be happening, we would use the subjunctive for that future action, right? So, si te voy a llamar, and also the use of the immediate future tense here kind of gives that indication. Te voy a llamar cuando llegue a casa. Hablemos más tarde. Adios, Pablo. Right? So, let's see some more here. Contextual dialogue. Look. Once again, this is a sample excellent answer based on CSEC's, CXC's 
rubric, right? And in the contextual dialogue, in assessing the contextual dialogue, the following aspects were considered. Adherence to the rubric, content, correctness of expression. Right, once again, adherence to the rubric, content, correctness of expression. Adherence to the rubric, what are you talking about? Length. Between 70 to 110 words here is the acceptable length for marking. Cues responded to all the cues, all of the five given cues with answers which were appropriate and of an adequate length. And this is very important, guys, because you could respond to every single cues and write 50 words in total. But automatically, if it is you do not meet the word count, even though you may have written on all the cues, CXE would mark you down automatically, and the rationale for marking you down would be that the cues were not sufficiently developed. Of course, this is in the instance if you didn't include all the cues. So you might write a sentence, you know, but your sentence might be too short. It might not have enough, right? So, ¿y qué te dijo el director cuando fuiste a su despacho? You might say, Estoy suspendido. That's not enough. I'm suspended. Or, que llame mi um, mamá. That I call my mother. No, that's a perfect response to this in Spanish, but it's not sufficiently developed. So you will be meeting the cues of what your principal would have said, um, description of the nature of your problem. That would be included under that. However, the issue is that it would not have been sufficiently developed. So it's not just about meeting the cues, but developing the cues and your responses sufficiently to meet the word length, right? Attachment of inserts. The insert was correctly filled out and properly attached. Okay, that's just this specific thing with the arm, um, with the spaces that they're talking about, right? So yeah. no stress. Um, Content, the candidates use all the cues, provided appropriate responses throughout. Some responses required reading and understanding the given stimulus, which immediately preceded the response, while others presented the stimulus immediately following the response. This is, this is the same thing I was speaking about, looking at what comes before, what precedes, and what follows, what comes after, right? So the candidate demonstrated mastery in eliciting responses from both forms of stimulus presentation. Once again, it's the same thing that I was highlighting before. And some of you all that are in my class, whether in school at St. Mary's or otherwise in classes, you would have heard me speak about this time and again. And we see in here, not Mr. Weeks, you can just simply do a Google search, CSEC Spanish sample contextual dialogue, and you will find this, right? A simple Google search. As I say, these are not my words, these are not my suggestions, as I just presented in a vacuum, right? Responses were well organized and clearly expressed, resulting in a dialogue which moved smoothly and was comprehensible. In addition, the candidate was able to couch the responses in language that flows quite naturally. What do I mean by couch the responses in language that flowed naturally? In other words, it were placed, they were placed, they were presented, they were structured in between in such a way that did not make the flow of the conversation seem irregular or unnatural, right? Correctness of expression, they showed a clear acquaintance with a number of expressor expressions, which were not of the run of the mill variety, right? A la vez enojada, a la vez meaning at the same time, me cuesta estudiar, Right, me cuesta means anybody, it's difficult for me too, right? Excuse me, or in other words, it costs me, it takes something from me, right? Tal vez me pudieras, amongst others. The script presented a variety of tenses, both in the indicative. Indicative simply means those, prints, those tenses that are not subjunctive or command. Once again, once we hear indicative, that simply means all those tenses that are not a command or the subjunctive, right? 
So the script presented a variety of tenses, both in the indicative as well as the subjunctive mood. So both subjunctive and indicative, so not commands. So tenses included the present tense, the preterite, the present continuous, the past perfect, the imperfect subjunctive. Additionally, the candidate showed knowledge of Spanish grammatical structure, for example, the use of the infinitive after poder, yo puedo, yo quiero, plus the infinitive, right? Agreements of all types and the use of object pronouns. Agreements of all types could be subject verb agreements. It could also be agreements of adjective and noun, right? The level of expansiveness of the vocabulary used was more than adequate for the requirements of the question. Some measures for improvement, the quality of work was reduced by the frequency of incorrect spelling, and that includes the insertion of accents where they were not required anterior también. Careful attention must be given to the correct spelling, and in the last utterance, the candidate should have recognized the need for the subjunctive mood after cuando, when the future is implied, right? Basically the same thing that I'll say. So this is it for this section, the contextual dialogue. Any further questions we have based on this? Not right now. Anything anybody does not understand, they want further clarification on? So, um, yes, they said it's excellent, but how much marks you have given them? Me? Yeah. Well, they're real preoccupied with marks, but... Um, A uh, thing like this could be between 18 to 20 marks. A response like this. For the persons that would have had me teach them and mark work and stuff by them, one of the things you would realize with me is that I shy away from giving marks. Eh? For the simple reason, I usually mark you harder than what CX you will re require. And I would mark you based on what you need to correct. So basically, you're marking for improvement, not to say you get a mark. It's easy to say you get a mark and be like, oh, well, I good that thing, you know? Because say, for example, um, Sienna, I would have marked on that person greatly because of the fact that they use one big paragraph for the letter. They'd have lost a lot. I would have, they would have lost marks for that for me. And I, because of that, I would not have considered excellent because there is such, uh, I don't want to say basic, such an elementary thing to, to leave out or forget, right? But based on what CX is asking, you're cool, you're good. Because what was also there was excellent use of language, the use of the past subjunctive, the use of the object pronoun correctly, that sort of stuff. The use of the personal R. Uh, that kind of thing, yeah? Which shows mastery of the language. When are we speaking our first language, English? It could be Spanish, French, whatever it is, our second language. We all make mistakes in language and CSEC, CXC recognizes this, yeah? The most important thing is communicating and communicating appropriately first, appropriately, and secondly, correctly correctly, right? Any other questions, comments? Anybody else want to contribute anything? Or are we all good? So, yeah, any yeah. um, contextual dialogues, you could send to practice. Tomorrow, in tomorrow's session, we, we're doing that. We're working on, um, we're working through some examples. Okay, kudos. So there's more for content. Anybody else? All right. I will take that as a no. We're almost to the finish line, guys. So we have one hour remaining. And we move into the last section of the exam, the reading comprehension, right? So with the reading comprehension, we need to pay attention to specific things. The title is deliberately written in English always, and that is there to help with your understanding of the reading comprehension passage and to give you context of what the passage is going to be about, okay? 
So we'll just go straight into the passage. Always look at the title. And as I believe it's in English, aided as actor, they may ask, so what could have been a title for the passage or what, what could have been a different title? Or what does the title, what does the, what meaning does it give? Pay attention to the title to try and extract meaning from the passage and context, right? Context cues, which we learn in English, you may not know every single word in the passage. I do not know every single word in Spanish after 20 years of studying the language, right? You may not know, most likely we will not know every single word in this Spanish passage. So from the start, don't expect that you're going in there and you meet a word, because let me tell you what has happened with students, huh? You meet a word that becomes so foreign that it affects your whole mood, that you almost kind of become turned off by the exam. So instead of trying to get the whole overall meaning, you move on to the next word and you realize, I don't know this either. Oh, shucks. I go cook. Oh, shucks. I'm in real trouble here. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But if it is we try and understand the passage as a whole, instead of trying to be down ourselves, all right, I don't know this word. I don't know this word. I don't know that word. There may be a word that came before, a word that come after that we may know. And we may not even know the word. Or it may be one, one of those cognates or friends, similar to a word in English, right? Let us use that as well to try and understand meaning in the passage. So use your context skills, right? Pay attention to the mark scheme as well, right? The mark scheme is not an indication of how much you had to write. So they give you, they tell you four marks. So you say, hmm, I had to write real plenty here. No. The mark scheme is an indication of how many pieces of information or how many details that CXC is looking for you to include in your response. So you may get, it may be four marks, but it might be four adjectives, four single individual words. And why am I saying this to you? You're running out of time. If you write those four adjectives that you're looking for, let's say the four pieces of information is four adjectives to describe a day or an event or a person, you will get your marks. So it's not so much about four marks, oh gosh, or X amount, one mark, I write a very little bit, or four marks, I need to write plenty. No, it's about the specific pieces of information or details. And a bonus tip or point, the last question in the reading passage is what we call an evaluative or appreciative question. It's usually this, right? It, and what does that mean? That simply means that it's not specifically asking you for a specific piece of information that you need to get from the passage and translate into English, because remember, we are writing in English. It doesn't mean that. Instead, what it means is that it's testing you to evaluate your un overall understanding. It's testing to get your overall appreciation of the passage after having read it, right? And what took place in the passage. So why do you think they would have named it this? Right? Um, they try to get your appreciation of the passage. Why do you think the passage was entitled this way? Your overall appreciation. That specifically, that information would not have been in the passage. We are naming it this because of that. No. Right? But always remember with that last question, it's always asking for something like that. Right? So once again, let's look at an example based on CSEC, a sample reading comprehension passage. And we look at responses and CSEX um, CSEX oh gosh recommendations based on what the candidates would have written right so Marissa's wig so automatically from the title it has something to do with somebody's name Marissa's wig her hair maybe something good a wig that she bought Maybe it's a wig that she lost. Maybe it's a wig that um, she wanted to have, or maybe she had to wear a wig for a specific reason. Something to do with Marissa's wig. We know that from the from the get go, right? So, Marissa era una mujer simpática, alegre, y tenía un cuerpo que todo el mundo admiraba. Un día ella fue a la playa con un compañero de trabajo 
que le gustaba mucho. Era su primera cita y realmente quería darle una impresión muy positiva. Aunque no tenía ninguna intención de nadar, se puso un vestido de baño muy colorido. Al llegar a la playa, ella y su compañero se sentaron en la arena. Charlaron y vivieron jugo por un rato, pero las aguas estaban tan atractivas que la pareja decidió nadar. Marisa fue la primera en entrar al mar. Apenas Marisa se tiró al agua. Se vio algo negro que flotaba en la superficie del mar. El compañero muy sorprendido le gritó, Marisa, mira ahí. Tu cabello está flotando. La pobre Marisa, muy avergonzada, salió corriendo del mar. ¡Qué vergüenza! Había olvidado quitarse la, la peluca y este hombre a quien estaba tratando de impresionar ahora se había enterado de su secreto. El compañero al verla avergonzada le dijo, no te preocupes, tengo secador en casa. So, what do we think is going on here? Anybody wants to check something? What do we think is going on here, anybody? Anyone? Before we go into it, based on what we know. Somebody and they went to the beach and a week photo. Or she went to the beach photo. I think it was a guy that she's, I don't know if it was a date, but yeah. She marking somebody. So what are we? She marking somebody. Yes, if it was Sienna was speaking yesterday with us, she was on a date. And where was this date? At the beach. On the beach, right? Anything else you wanna, anything else, other information we glean from this? What hints did, did it give you that they were on the beach? What are somebody who is that hint at the fact that they were at the beach? We fue a la playa. playa. Okay, fue a la playa, what else? Nadar. Nadar, excellent. What about la arena? What does la arena mean? The arena or something else? Is that like a court? Okay, we'll break it up a bit, Tiana, but la arena means something. So this is an example of a false friend. So as much as you're looking out for the vocabulary, you need to pay attention or be careful too of words that may be false friends. So la arena looks like the word arena in English, but it actually means sad, right? So upon arriving to the beach, she and her companion, a friend, is sat in the sun, right? So we also see entrar al mar, enter the sea, se tiró al agua, tirarse al agua means to jump in the water, tirar means to throw, T-I-R-A-R, -A tirar means to throw, but one of them is reflexive, it means what? The action is done. You trace it. Onto the oneself. In the water. In other words, she jumped, she jumped in the water, right? Um, <laughs> right. So let me give you a quick rough translation, all right? Marissa's way, Marissa was very, was a very nice and cheerful or pleasant woman, and she had a body that everyone admired. One day she went to the beach with a work colleague that she liked very much. It was her first date and she really wanted to give a very positive impression. So impression, just like the English word impression, right? Although they didn't have any intention of swimming, she put on a bathing suit or dress that was very colorful. What's another way of saying um, being in suit? Anybody knows? Traje de baño. T-R-A-G-E. Un traje de baño as well could be the phrase used, right? 
Upon arriving at the beach, she and her friend, they sat in the sun, they chatted and drank juice for a while, but the water was so attractive that the couple decided to swim. Marissa was the first, <laughs> Marissa was the first to enter the sea. Perhaps, one second. She was the first to enter the water, um, or to throw herself in the water, and she saw something black floating on the surface of the water, la superficie, means surface, right? The friend, very surprised, shouted to her, Marissa, look there, your hair is floating. Poor Marissa, very shame, she left or she ran out of the water, right? Of the beach. What a shame. She had forgotten to take off her wig and this man, who she was trying to impress, now had noticed her secret. Well, he had become aware of her secret. The friend on seeing her shame said to her, don't worry, I have a dryer at home. All right, or I hear dryer. Nice, this is a very embarrassing thing to go try imagine. Is that correct, ladies? Focus on yourself. <laughs> yeah, very well, all little too young to have, yeah, I feel like the fellas here might be too young to have extension, what let's call it, a male unit. I feel people like me who here started the turn in the center and who get ball and stuff, yeah? Okay. But I imagine it's a very embarrassing thing to go through, right? So let's look at the questions. This is something that I forgot to mention any points as well, but it's extremely important. Before you even go about answering, as a matter of fact, how would I, appro how I would approach doing this is before I even read the passage, I will read the questions. Why would I do this? The questions helps you to streamline what specific pieces of information you need to seek out from the passage. So it's seeing that it's highly possible. <laughs> yes, no, I just reading some of the message here. Anushka, you ask a question, meaning when it, how it scans, referring to what? So how it looks there, how it responses, is that how it scans the CSA? Yeah, well, when, when it's scanned, because we know everything is online now, this is how the examiner will see it, the market now. So is it true that black pens scan better than blue? I would imagine so, but it should make a difference. It really depends on how well the um, pen is writing. Make sure you have a good writing ballpoint pen, I would say, right? So the point I was making before is that you would, I would read through all the questions first and then read the passage because this will guide you as to what you're specifically looking for, streamline the information that you're looking for. Because we know in the exam conditions, one thing is we will know every single word and two, we know that we're working against the clock, right? So although it might seem as if this was wasting time, this actually helps you to save time by reading the questions first, right? So we know we're looking for information on our personality, something about admire, and also by seeing these words in English, when it is you see certain words in Spanish, you'll realize the certain similarities of friends. What they admire, admiraba, looks like the word admire, etc., right? With whom did she go out, describe her outfit, mention three things that her and her companion did on the beach. So you see three marks, three pieces of information or details you're looking for. Why they decided to go for a swim, what happened when she dived into the water, what was her companion's immediate reaction, how Marissa reacted, and explain why she reacted that way. Once again, we see the evaluative or appreciative thing, right? They didn't explicitly say any passage, she reacted this way because X, Y, Z, right? They didn't use those words. They may have used a word that hinted at how she reacted, 
But for three marks, right? If they wanted to know what word was used to describe a reaction, then they would say one mark. But they're not only looking for the word, but they're looking for your rationale as to why it is you feel this way. So this is why it's evaluative or appreciative, the last question, right? Understood? Yes, sir. Nice. Um, I'm not going on. Should I go to the candidate's responses? Babe? All right, let's see. Marissa's a nice and cheerful woman. People admire her body. She went up with someone who she worked with or a work companion who she really liked. Number three, what is number three asking for again? With whom did she go up for two marks, right? Um, a colorful bathing suit, three things that she, she and her companion were sat on the sand talk or chatted and drank juice. Decided to go for a swim because the water looked very nice and inviting. Excuse me. What's number six? Why did they decide to go for a swim for one mark? <clears throat> and what happened when she dived into the water? The so wake came off and floated to the surface. Her companion's immediate reaction was that he was surprised and yelled out to her that he was floating. She was embarrassed and went out of the sea running. She had reacted that way because she had forgotten to take it off, and it was the main thing she was really trying to. And this was the main thing, the main, this was the man she was really trying to impress, and now her secret was out, right? So I would have not, I would have included here that she reacted that way because she was ashamed. And what hinted, what the hint that I would use for that is, Que vergüenza, what a shame. And then her friend, upon seeing her ashamed, he said this to her, right? So he try and soften the feeling of shame that she felt, right? So I would have mentioned it that she feel ashamed. And then why? Because she was trying to impress this guy um, that she really liked first date, that kind of thing, right? So let's see what CSEC responds and says to us. What do you recommend to us, sorry? Example of an excellent answer in assessing this question, marks were awarded for comprehension. Errors made in English were not heavily, you notice, were not heavily penalized. That don't mean that you're gonna write horrible English for the people. Try as best as possible to write in complete sentences in English, right? But you will not be heavily penalized for errors in English, except where the language was, or the use of English distorted or affected what was being said or what you are trying to communicate, right? The rubric was respected, answered questions in English as was required, responses indicated, showed that the candidate understood the passage. There was serious pitfalls deserve. The responses provided indicated that the candidate had fully understood the passage. There were serious pitfalls deserving of a tremendous loss of marks. So let's see. So the candidate in question one, describe her personality. The candidate selected two appropriate adjectives from the passage, as we see from the passage, to describe her personality. Sufficient information provided, full marks awarded. Question two, which is, what did people admire about her for one mark? And she said, the body, an appropriate response was given based on the info. So marks that have been awarded. Question three, the candidate extracted the, DC, the details necessary to provide a fully appropriate response. Let's again see what was asked and what was responded. With whom did she go out for two marks? The response was, she went out with someone she worked with, a workmate, and that she really liked. For two marks, somebody she worked with, or a workmate, workmate, and the fact that she liked the person, or really liked the person, right? Question four, two distinct pieces of information were required. Mention of the outfit, a bathing suit, and a description of the outfit, colorful, right? This candidate supplied both elements 
and the marks were awarded accordingly. Already, I remember that one of the bottom heads are answered, right? Okay? Question five, candidate clearly demonstrated knowledge of the vocabulary that was expected to be recognized in order to respond correctly. And the candidate noted three points which answered the question. The question was, mention three things that she and her companion did. The appropriate vocabulary, charla, to chat, beber, sentarse, right? And she said they would have done that. Chatted, drank juice, and sat in the sand. Did she say sand? Yes, and sat on the sand. Question number six, the candidate interpreted the information correctly and provided an acceptable response. Six asks, why did they decide, decide to go for a swim? And we remember the answer being that the water was inviting and nice. Question seven, what happened when Marissa dived into the water for two marks? Spoke about the wig coming off and floating to the surface. Those two things, let's see what C6 says. All the elements required were outlined. Follow the thread of this story by mentioning her wig. And this was inferred correctly. The person would have made mention of those two things as well. The wig coming off one, floating to the surface two. Two pieces of information or details. Um, number eight, access. What was the companion's immediate reaction for two marks? He was surprised and he advised her that it was floating. What did the candidate say? He was surprised and he yelled or told her that it was floating by yelling. Two specific elements were adequate to respond fully. Once again, two specific elements, not two words, not two adjectives, but as I said, either details or information, pieces of information, right? It could be an adjective in some case, in other cases, it may be one phrase by another phrase, two phrases, right? Which gives specific information, right? All the information was given. <clears throat> Number nine, they responded appropriately, provided all providing all details. Number nine asks us, how did Marissa react to her companion's comment? And number 10 is why she reacted that way. She was embarrassed and went out of the sea running. <clears throat> number nine, the candidate responded appropriately, providing details, and number 10, made some correct inference and was awarded marks accordingly. Measure for improvement. With regard to the question 10, the response could have been improved with more specific information as obtained from the passage. For example, she forgot to take it off. It could have made response to the wig. Come model answer, her companion who she was trying to impress found out that she was wearing a wig, right? So that is the reason for her shame, very, very vergüenza, a vergüenza, right? So we have a, even when CXC went further to give us a model answer that meets the three mark requirements based on the question asked. Explain why she reacted that way. And they said, the companion whom she was trying to impress found out that she was wearing a wig. And I want to add an additional piece of information here that they are, I'm seeing the second time that they mentioning. It is good in your responses where and when necessary to make reference to the title of the reading passage, right? To show that you understand and to tie everything together. Nice? And that is the end of- Yes, sir. Tell me. Yana, you were saying something or you just said yes, sir? Yes, I was angry. 
Okay, you are agreeing with me. Anybody has any questions? Any other questions? Uh, based on the contextual dialogue. No, sir. Alika left. Sir, I'm having problems remembering which is informal and which is formal. Specific to what? The object pronouns, like, yeah, like when we're doing the. Now you're breaking up a lot, Tiana, but I think I understand what you asked, right? Just generally expressing form formality in Spanish. Just message in the chat if that's what you mean, yeah? Correct? So let's see. So I'll just make up a quick note on the spot here, and I hope this helps. So subject pronouns, we know that usted means you, formal, right? When we want to communicate something in Spanish, speaking, referring to someone as you, but we are required to be formal in our use of you, right? So we use usted when it is, We want to communicate something, but we're referring to someone as you, and we require to be formal, right? So for example, um, a stranger asks for directions to the nearest ATM. I just put in this so that you learn with one time, right? Cajero automatico, automatic cashier, literally, right? A stranger asks for directions to the nearest ATM. What do you say? Response. Tiene. What will be understood as usted. Tiene. Que seguir. Recto y dobla a la derecha al fin de la calle. So, you want to say to the person, Tiana, you have to continue straight and then make a right at the end of the street. But you're not saying tienes because it's a stranger. That is why we're using the usted version. Usted tiene que seguir recto. Y doblar, sorry, y doblar a la derecha al fin de la calle. So you, formal, as a stranger, we don't know the person, we show them respect. You have to continue straight and make a right at the end of the street. So we can see formality being used with subject pronouns, right? You're following me so far, Tiana? 
Yes, sir. All right, another place we can see formality being used. And just let me go back. Who stay this means you all and is used once it is a group of people. It does not matter if we are trying to be formal or not. Once we mean you all. Right? Once you want to say you all, they use the ustedes, right? Following me? Yes, sir. Another place we can, okay, I don't see a message. Um, another place we can see formality being used is with the use of demonstrative adjectives. Right, what are the demonstrative adjectives? Me, my, to, your, to, is, to, your, and then nuestro, nuestra, nuestros, nuestras, right? So we see formality being used with the, if you want to say it is your something, um, so we say, sir, what? sir, is this your eraser? As any white body eraser, right? You want to ask somebody, sir, is this your eraser? You want to ask the teacher that, right? Or the teacher. You, you see a white body eraser on a desk and you would like to ask the teacher, is this your eraser? What do you say? The response will be, Señor, es su borrador. So once again, usually two would be used to, as a demonstrative adjective to say your something. But when we want to be formal, we would use su in place of it. Su could also mean his or her. So we could say, es su lapis. It is her pencil. Is, or um, it is his pencil, right? But su is also used when we want to be, when we want to say your, meaning the formal version of you. Right? So, su, is this your eraser, señor? Es su borrador? Right, is this your eraser? Demonstrative adjectives can also be, sorry, formality can also be seen as expressed with reflexive pronouns, right? So you're, no, you're noticing a trend so far, it's always the he, she, it version, the his version, etc. right? So our reflexive pronouns are what? Me, te, se, nos, se. But if we want to be, if we want to express formality, to say, sorry, using the reflexive pronouns. We use the equivalent pronoun that goes with el, ella, usted. I-E-C. 
So what do I mean? Let's get an example once again. Um, so at what time do you get up on a morning? For some reason, you want to ask the teacher this question, right? Let's say it's teacher, profe, a que hora se levanta las mañanas. Or por las mañanas, rather. At what time do you get up? on mornings. A que hora se levanta? Once again, Tiana, we using the form of the verb that would usually go with the el, ella, usted version. And in this case, the reflexive pronoun se that accompanies it. Nice? So we see, let me just recap so that I can think, as I say, I'm making up this on the spot. We see the formality expressed with subject pronouns. We see it with demonstrative adjectives. We see it with reflexive pronouns. We also see formality with object pronouns. Let's use. And if it is I'm losing you at any point or anything, please, I beg, interrupt me so I can slow down. Right? And explain or clear up any doubt you may have. Diana, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So this time I want you to give me the example, right? Object pronouns, we have direct object. What are the direct object pronouns? people don't want to give because they, 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 they know we're being recorded. We have me, te, lo, la, nos, los, las. And the indirect object pronouns are me, te, le, nos, les. So as we saw earlier in the class today, once again, the le refers, could not only mean him or her, but it could also mean you. The les could not only mean they, referring to a group of females, they, referring to a group of males, but could also mean you all, right? And in this case, and in this these cases here, that you all could be formal, or informal, it doesn't matter. But it will be you all plural, right? So, direct object. We have the sentence. Um, Sir. I bought you a gift. What else that become in Spanish? Let's use profe again as a shorter profe. Lo compre, rather. Compre. I bought you a gift. Let me keep it simple because I'll end up in some more explanations. I don't want to confuse you too much yet. I bought you a gift. So lo compre un regalo. In this case here, regalo is the indirect object. So how do we tell direct bit? How do we tell direct and indirect object apart?
Okay, and I want you to okay. How do we tell direct and indirect object apart? The direct object is the action that is tied immediately to the verb, or in other words, it happens immediately after. And the indirect object happens to the direct object, right? So I bought what or who? I bought you. Mm -hmm. This is a bad example. I now realize there's a taking a spot here. A gift here will be the direct, and for you will be the indirect. Let me use a different example. I apologize for this. Um, as I say, I'm making it up on the spot as I go along. Let's think of a different sentence. Um, okay, somebody says, Hola, Tiana. Te conozco desde tu infancia. Me reconoces. You meet somebody in the street, you can see this person since he's like five years old, but he knows our family friend. But the person don't know if you remember them, right? So they said, hi, Tiana. I know you from since you are an infant, right? Do you remember me? So I repeat, we have the object pronouns here, the direct and the indirect object pronouns, right? And as I would have been stating before, the third person singular or the version of the pronoun that goes with the he, she, it, you formal is usually the one that is used as the formal. So in this case, the low or the la, and in this case, the low, the lay, sorry. So I wanna give an example, right? So you have somebody that says, hi, Tiana, I know you since you were a, or they say, era infantera. Since you are an infant, do you remember me? Or do you recognize me? And your response, si lo conozco. Yes, I should have an accent. I, rec I know you. This you here, because the person is older than you, right? Is somebody that you should show respect to, you wouldn't say you wouldn't use the T here. You would use the low or the formal version of you. I recognize you. You with me so far? Yes, Diana? sir. And anybody else, in case this may be of benefit to you, right? If it were the direct object, the indirect object, sorry, we would use the lay, right? So we have object pronouns, reflexive verbs, and reflexive pronouns. We have subject pronouns. We have demonstrative pronouns. So these are the different ways and times we may use the um, formality in Spanish, right? Outside of that, with regard to the verbs, outside of that, we know the titles calling somebody senor, Senora, Mrs. Mary, Senorita, Miss Don, Doña. Don or Doña is like, hmm, how to describe this? It's like a title of respect that you give to somebody, right? So somebody that may have some sort of high esteem within society, that kind of thing. Um, let me look up a proper dictionary meaning of an explicit dictionary meaning of dog. One second, huh?
Mr. In other words, is I really Mr. or Mrs., but is used more. It is used more in a case where, as I say, the person has some sort of prominence in society as opposed to any person that is older and you will call Mr. or Mrs., yeah? Um, if you're talking to a priest, pastor, if it's a pastor, padre, free Roman Catholics, father, whatever. By the way, un cura is a priest. If it's feminine, una cura it means a cure, right? So when we're speaking about formality, is in those instances we need to remember it's being used. When we're addressing persons with specific titles, right? It will be used, if we use any object pronouns, we would use the lo or the la, and we would use the le when referring to the person as you, right? We would use certain reflexive pronouns using the say version of the verb when referring to them as you. I care what I say, Levanta. What time do you get up? But because it's a teacher, somebody older than you, somebody in authority, you show them respect and use the formal version of you. Demonstrative pronouns, not pronouns, sorry, adjectives. You want to say my, this, your, that. Right? But when you want to say your, meaning your formal, senor is suborador, is this your eraser? Is this your eraser? We use the su, that is the formal version. Subject pronouns. Right, who we'll stayed? Nice. Any other questions by anybody else? Okay, I'm not seeing a message here, Tiana. What is the general location of pronouns for direct? It comes before the verb. The general location of all pronouns in Spanish are before the conjugated verb. I repeat, you see this all the time. The general location for all pronouns in Spanish are before the conjugated verb. Doesn't matter if it's conjugated in the present tense, the preterite, the imperfect, doesn't matter the tense. Before the verb when it is conjugated. If the verb is not conjugated, it is in the infinitive, it is in the um, command form, it is in the infinitive command and the third one. It is in the present participle form. It is attached to the verb at the end of the verb. So for instance, mi madre me compró un regalo. My mother bought me a gift. Me compró. She bought me. Comprar is conjugated in the preterite tense. Mi madre me compró un regalo. However, you can say, Mama, comprame un regalo. Mom, buy me a gift. That is the command form. Comprame. It's attached to the verb and it's made one word. Comprame. Mi madre está comprándome un regalo. I'll answer that just now, Tiana. Mi madre me compró Sorry, you're confused with it. Mi madre está comprándome un regalo. Comprándome. The me is attached to comprando. That is the present participle version of the verb, right? The ing version. Or, um, ¿Qué vas a comprarme, mamá? What are you going to buy me, mom? In the infinitive form. So, I repeat. Pronouns in Spanish are placed before the conjugated verb. We even see it with the, um, with the reflexive verbs, right? The reflexive verbs, um, quiero relajarme mañana, I want to relax myself tomorrow, right? Me relajo los domingos, I relax myself on Sundays. Me relajo, conjugated verb, before the conjugated verb. The me, right? But quiero, I want to relajarme. Relajar, infinitive, the me is added to the word at the end. 
why not compre? Why not me compre? Me compre is not compre means I bought, but you want to say my mother bought or she bought me. So the she bought is two different things there. Right? Okay, I see you understand. So that's why not me compre? Me compre would mean I bought myself. Reflexive. The action is done. We have the same subject. But me mama me compro. My mom bought me. She bought me. I see. We'll conjugate it in the preterite. She bought and the object me. I am the recipient of the action. The thing being bought. Right? Any other questions by anybody else? Javon, Kershal, Anushka. Abdul Kudos, Megan, Sierra Nai. Not right now, sir. No, All right, guys. No. So here's what we're gonna do. Tomorrow you can bring further questions, further as we run come to a close. Um further questions, if it is you. We have attempted an essay in the past and you want to share it on the World Wide Web. You could bring it and I'll correct it for you tomorrow. Um, if not, you might just have a question or a query on a specific question for whichever aspect you may say. So how you will answer this? What's an appropriate response for this situation? What's an appropriate response for this question in the comprehension passage, etc. How much marks you'll give for that? Those sort of stuff we're doing tomorrow. Bring your questions, bring your queries based on past paper questions. You we'll doing some work examples tomorrow. Nice. Yes, sir. Yes. yes right, sir. guys. I hope we will be posting this later tonight as well. So look out for the YouTube link. It will be posted to our YouTube page. And uh, we will be in contact hasta mañana. Ojalá que no. Ojalá que nos veamos mañana. I hope we see each other tomorrow. Yeah, man, bring me. <laughs> okay, a lot of contextual dialogues, no problem. I will send it to you all in the group chat immediately after. Any other questions? Another. All right, guys, stay safe, stay healthy. Of course, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see each other tomorrow. Nice, take care. Adios.